Finding Felicity by Lewis Kirk Chapter 1 The University of Westminster was a dull, square building, right angles and straight lines as far as the eye could see. It was located in a leafy part of Harrow, northwest London, within view of the famous and influential Harrow School, where none other than Winston Churchill attended. The connecting tube station was Northwick Park on the Metropolitan Line, 20 minutes from the centre of London. The campus was so close to Northwick Park Hospital that they could be considered part of the same structure, one giant grey urban block. On any given day, if you were to observe the people emerging from the tube station like ants from a crack in the pavement, you would see all the varieties of life. There would be young, vital, university students intermingled with every kind of hospital worker, visitor and patient, pregnant women, cancer patients, people who had lost their eyesight or their hearing or their mobility, new life, suffering, old age and death, the four noble truths. From the lecture hall a siren could be heard distinctly over the speaker, the admission of yet another unlucky soul being taken to the accident and emergency ward to receive life-saving treatment, the ever-present reality of the frailty of life. It was the last lecture of the day, and George could not wait for the bell to ring. Freedom! For the last twenty minutes he had been watching the giant clock on the wall, above and to the right of him, watching it with stealth so as not to be seen by the professor, watching it, hoping it would move more quickly than it was presently, Time is relative, and it was passing subjectively slowly at this late hour of the day. He must have held its gaze for longer than stealth allowed, because he heard his name come out of the professor's mouth, which was never good. Are we keeping you, George? Professor Ospensky boomed from the front of the class. Do you have somewhere more important to be? Some significant engagement? No, sir, I was just checking the time, that's all. You must know, Mr. Temple that time passes in a linear and regular fashion, the professor stated with an air of superiority. It is two minutes later than the last time you checked, and four minutes later than the time before that. Don't think I am ignorant of what is occurring in my own lecture hall, Mr. Temple. George tried to think of something clever to say from his seat twenty rows back. He couldn't. Try to think of a lame excuse. Nothing. It was too late in the day, and his brain was running on empty. As you are so interested in time, the professor said after a short pause, why don't you give us a definition and a proposition on the nature of time, Mr. Temple, if you please? Thought causes movement. Desire precedes action. A consequence of his lack of covertness in clock-watching had landed him in a right mess. The entire lecture hall was looking at him waiting for his response. George desperately needed his brain to click into gear and push back against the professor, to tally up a minuscule win within the grand scheme of life. Every action we perform changes the universe forever. Each choice results in a change that we have to live with for all time, and right now George was stuck, like a fly in a spider's web with nowhere to run to. If time was moving slowly before, it now felt as though it had positively stopped. He racked his brain for all the information it contained about the nature of time, seconds, minutes and hours that we use to keep track of where we are, where we are going or where we should be. The revolution of the earth on its axis was made up of 24 hours. A complete orbit of the earth around the sun constituted a year or 365 days. These units of time were broken up for the sake of convenience into hours and minutes which we call clock time. But then there was the procession of the equinoxes, vast epochs of time that are universal and all-encompassing. Could he not say something about that? In the end, what seemed like hours had passed while he was thinking of what to say. He decided to avoid any confrontation or clashing of heads and gave an answer that any physicist would be proud of. George cleared his throat and said a Hail Mary. <clears throat> time is considered the fourth dimension of our physical reality. 
we perceive time as a progression in consciousness from past to future, but it is never anything other than the present moment, the eternal now. Moment by moment our experience is being born. We think that yesterday is the past and tomorrow will be the future, but these are just intellectual processes that allow us to feel comfortable in our daily lives. Like I said, we perceive time in a linear way, but there is only ever the present moment. He feared that he might have let himself drift away from philosophical arguments and into metaphysical speculations, and held his breath while he waited for the response to come. The silence seemed to last for an eternity. Professor Ospensky was stroking his chin and looked deep in contemplation. This was, after all, the final year of their philosophy and religious studies course, and these kinds of topics were discussed daily. But the class had never seen the professor look so meditative. Very good, George, he finally said in a distant and detached voice. I like that. What? George thought. You like it? No witty dismissal? No dialectical flaws in his statements? He liked it? The bell sounded. The lecture hall erupted into furious activity. Chairs scraped, tables banged, conversations began. One last thing before you go, Professor Ospensky had to shout above the noise to get their attention. Tomorrow we will be discussing the Greek concept of eudaimonia, the good life, and man's position in the cosmic scheme. For homework you should read Plato's Phaedo or Iamblichus's Exhortation to Philosophy. Good day. Just like that, he was free, free from the confines of class timetables and professors, free from the judgmental eyes of fellow students, free from everything he despised about university and society. Our souls have an inherent longing for freedom, the enlightenment of Buddhism, the mukti, liberation of the Upanishads. What freedom is there for the majestic cat in his box at the zoo? Where can a caged bird experience freedom but the infinite sky? George rarely liked to hang around after a lecture to engage in small talk, so he often took the scenic route around the campus through the neighbouring golf course. It was a perfect time to decompress the lessons from the day and ponder on life's wonders. The disk of the sun was a few minutes above the horizon and it painted a beautiful array of yellows and oranges in the sky. There was an interesting contrast between the straight lines and concrete to the grass and trees that really helped to create a connection with the surroundings of great nature. After all, it has only been in recent years that we have begun to spend most of our time in our man-made cells. While walking in the serene nature, George couldn't stop thinking about how time had seemingly slowed to a stop during those final minutes of class. The second hand was crawling so slowly around the face of that clock, but when Professor Ospensky mentioned his name, time seemed to slow even more. While he was thinking, it felt like it stopped altogether. What was this phenomena? Why did it occur? Thoughts about his nan came to mind, and so he made a mental note to ask her about it the next time he spoke to her. He made it a practice while walking in nature to perform a walking meditation bringing all of his awareness to his body and its movements, of the sensations that came from the cool evening breeze on his skin, his heavy legs pounding the grass after a long day of studies. With as much practice as he had done, this meditation practice should have been more straightforward than it was this evening. Constant distractions about time and its relativity kept interrupting his immediate task. Why do we perceive time as relative, was the thought that kept invading his awareness. Each time he found himself distracted from bodily awareness, he returned to the fundamental tenets of walking meditation. Awareness, physical sensation, his feet on the grass, the cool air on his skin, and his heavy legs each time he lifted them up from the ground. This walking meditation had been going for 10 or 15 minutes when he thought he heard his name, in a barely audible whisper, George, in no more than a murmur. He ignored it as yet another internal distraction and continued on his path. Then again, slightly more clearly, George. Not clear enough for him to be done with his walking meditation. Then, 
all of a sudden, loudly and clearly to the point of pain into his right ear, George! It was his friend and classmate Ali Hussein. Ali was a touch shorter than George and had a wispy beard with a trim moustache in the Islamic custom. Another custom he had adopted was to wear a tawb, an Islamic tunic, which appeared like a fashionable dress for men. Ali insisted he wore it to maintain modesty and to follow the Prophet, but George wasn't convinced. All right, George, I've been calling you for the last 200 yards. You're away with the fairies. Oh yeah, sorry, Ali, I couldn't hear you. I was doing my walking meditation practice. Pah, walking meditation? Ali retorted with an air of dismissal. Forget all that meditation rubbish. Come with me to the mosque for evening prayer. Did you read the Quran I gave you? Yes, I did actually. It was very similar to the Old Testament in my opinion. A bit dark and antiquated. Too many rules and regulations for me if I'm honest. Once I finished the Quran, I read some of the hadiths and then a biography of the life of the Prophet. They were quite informative. I liked his biography very much. Whoa, slow down, bro. I haven't even read about his life yet. But as a Muslim, isn't it your duty to educate yourself about Islam? Nope. Just do my five salah each day and live by the rules and I'm guaranteed entry to paradise. That's why you should come with me to the mosque, bro. Otherwise your soul isn't guaranteed salvation. George hated it when Ali was so forceful in his beliefs and opinions. He'd much rather have a philosophical debate about a platonic or neoplatonic text where things weren't so set in stone and inflexible. He knew where this conversation would go, as he had had it a thousand times before, and just as he was about to excuse himself, a wonderful analogy came into his mind. These two had been friends for many years, and Ali always advocated for Islam. In this way, they could have fairly open and lively debates about the nature of religion in general, and Islam in particular. Answer me this, George said, looking Ali straight in the eye. You believe 100% in the existence of God and paradise, and that by following the tenets of Islam and accumulating good deeds, you will find yourself there when you die. Absolutely, bro. No doubt in my mind. I believe it with all my being. But the atheist believes with just as much, if not more, confidence and conviction of the exact opposite, that there is no God and no hereafter and no eternal paradise. Yes, of course, but they are wrong, Ali pronounced. George chuckled with an attitude of dismissal. Ha! <laughs> so you think that you are right and they are wrong, and they think you are wrong and they are right. For me, looking at it from a broader perspective, I see there is a way for you both to be right, and equally for neither of you to be right. If I'm totally honest with you, Ali, I prefer compassion over righteousness and I prefer acceptance over intolerance, which is why I spend most of my time on the Greeks and Eastern traditions, mate. Peace and love and all that, over fire and brimstone. I see a world full of hope and goodness as opposed to intolerance, a world where everything exists as potential and is therefore within our grasp. If it is possible for one human being to live a selfless, good and compassionate life, then surely by this fact alone it is possible for everyone to be happy and fulfilled in equal measure. Ali was clearly struggling to comprehend this logical sleight of hand and was struck visibly dumb. George suddenly remembered something he needed to do. Sorry Ali, I've got to go. I need to clean up the flat before my mum gets home from work. I've left it in a right state and she will kill me if she sees it like it is. Awa salam alaykum. Awa alaykum salam. See you tomorrow. They parted with a handshake and a bro-hug and went their separate ways. The sun was below the horizon now and the sky was a dull grey with only hints of red and orange dispersed like a painter's strokes on the sky's canvas. George resumed his walking practice. It was always more difficult to maintain awareness while on the road with so many distractions. Cars, people, shop windows, everything that nature did not contain. Perhaps that was why he preferred walking on the golf course. This time, his meditation was being distracted by different thoughts. Firstly, about how much work he had to do when he got home with the tidying up of the flat. But once he had resolved his plan of attack for the cleaner, he kept thinking about his nan. She was a special lady in his life, 
a beautiful soul who had made an impact all throughout his life, through her wisdom, but more than that, through her example. Emerging from this thought came a clear visual image into his mind's eye, as distinct as the day it was registered in his memory. The chest in his nan's flat could be seen as unmistakably as if he were standing before it. This sacred chest would be connected to thoughts of his nan as closely as the flat in which she lived. It contained all of her special books, books that she never felt comfortable having out on display on her bookshelves, as well as all of the relics she had collected over the years. George only had a vague idea of what the chest contained, as he had never actually been able to inspect it at his leisure. It was firmly off limits. Thinking about the question he wanted to ask her about the nature of time, his phone rang, loud and authoritative, from his front pocket. As he reached for his device, he thought about how he despised what the interconnectivity of the world had done for and to humanity, people having more in-depth and meaningful relationships with their smartphones and laptops than their family or friends. Glancing at the now visible screen, he saw Nan displayed. What a synchronicity, he thought to himself, as he swiped to answer. Hey Nan, how are you? You'll never guess what. I was just this minute thinking about you and what I wanted to talk to you about. Well, spooky, isn't it? A real chance occurrence. There are no coincidences in this life, Georgie boy, only the degree to which we perceive the ultimate reality, his nan said in her infinite wisdom. How was the lecture today? Anything interesting happen? She seemed to be asking this question not from a place of ignorance, but from one of knowing like she knew something interesting had happened today. Yes, it did actually, Nan. George had so anticipated being able to discuss the phenomena of time with his wise old Nan that he could barely collect his thoughts to begin. It's about the nature of time. Before he could move on to the second sentence of his grand exposition of the wonders of time, his Nan cut him off. No time for all that, sonny boy. EastEnders is about to start. You still coming up to see me for a cuppa at the weekend? Of course, Nan, I can't wait. Maybe we can talk about it then. Maybe, who knows? One thing I will say before EastEnders starts. It's just about to come on, so I'd better be quick. Was reading an old Taoist book of the ancient masters the other day, and they were talking about how the adepts of the lineage can put their bodies into hibernation and allow the soul to leave the body and go on exploring the cosmos. The bodies become cold and rigid after a time, and it's best to have them locked in a room so that no one finds them and becomes alarmed. The funny thing about it is, is that I have read about the same phenomena in books about yogis and Sufis too. Crazy, isn't it? Imagine putting your body into suspended physical animation while your soul soars on high with the angels and archangels. As she finished her amazing story, George could hear the unmistakable opening theme music from EastEnders. He was just about to ask her a question about bodily hibernation and soul detachment when he heard her voice again over the theme music. All right, Georgie, EastEnders is about to start. Gotta go. We can carry on again over a cuppa at the weekend. Say hello to that mother of yours for me, will ya? Tell her to call me up. Bye. There was the tone of a finished conversation. George's mind was reeling. He was hoping to clear up some of his questions and queries with a chat with his nan, but she had multiplied his confusion exponentially. She always had a habit of doing that, never making it easy for him by simply answering his question directly. There was always some mystic and subtle clue for him to unravel, and this time was no different. He resolved to question her at their meeting over the weekend. Before he put his phone back into his pocket, he checked the time. 6.40 p.m. Damn! He had better get moving if he was going to get home and have the flat tidied before his mum got in.